Chapter 98 The Garment, a Robe, and Its Pomegranates Exodus chapter 28, verses 31 to 35 And thou shalt make the robe of the ephod all of blue, and there shall be an hole in the top of it, in the midst thereof it shall have a binding of woven work round about the whole of it, as it were, the whole of an habergeon, that it be not rent. And beneath upon the hem of it thou shalt make pomegranates of blue, and of purple, and of scarlet round about the hem thereof, and bells of gold between them round about. A golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe round about. And it shall be upon Aaron to minister, and his sound shall be heard when he goeth in unto the holy place before the Lord, and when he cometh out, that he die not. Exodus chapter 28 verses 31 to 35 We have a reference to the robe of the ephod. It is referred to as a habergeon, a kind of corselet normally made of chain mail. In this case, it is not so. Old-time Celtic chiefs wore such a garment. There was a hole at the top with a binding of woven work around it to prevent tearing. The garment was slipped on over the head. The blue cloth as a background would bring out strongly the majesty of the ephod and its breastplate. Hanging onto the robe were apparently tassels in the shape of pomegranates and bells of gold. James MacGregor said that the purpose of these bells was to announce the entrance of the high priest into the presence of God. In antiquity and into the modern era, an unannounced appearance into the presence of a king meant death. The privacy of a superior could not be casually violated on any level of life. As a result, the high priest's presence as he moved to enter the Holy of Holies was announced by the ringing of the golden bells. In the Christian era, the use of bells has continued. Church bells are rung to declare that Christ's resurrection not only summons men to worship their Creator, but also to declare the happy fact of access to God. The word blue in verse 31 is probably our violet. Although pomegranates were ancient symbols of fertility, there is nothing in the text to indicate anything but a decorative purpose. The robe was apparently sleeveless and reached to the ankles. It was a garment indicating high rank. The bells meant also that the high priest could not stir without the knowledge of the people, while the essential purpose of the bells was to announce his entry into the Holy of Holies. The bells also enabled the people to follow his movements. As the people listened to the bells, they were able to trace the high priest's every step. We have references to the pomegranates and their place in the Temple of Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 20 and verse 42. They were part of the artwork and they numbered 400. At no point are we given a word about their meaning. It is thus without warrants for anyone to read a meaning into the pomegranates other than the specified in Exodus 28 verse 2 and 40 for glory and for beauty. There have been attempts to read some other meaning into the pomegranates but like much else in the tabernacle and the priestly garments such attempts are guilty of borrowing meaning from sources other than scripture. One of the tendencies of the modern era has been to deny ultimate meaning, that is, God, and to reduce all things to a utilitarian level. In architecture, for example, starkly bare lines and a machine-like barrenness of all beauty has been endemic. Any emphasis on beauty as such, or the ability of skilled craftsmen, is outlawed. 
Some of us knew Richard Earle, an artist who, with his father, crafted many fixtures, cabinets, and other things in such interiors as Scotty's Castle in Death Valley, the Doheny Manson in Los Angeles, and more. At the beginning of the 20th century, such craftsmanship often went into the construction of middle-class homes. Meaning has now been reduced to man and restricted to the service of utility, a meagre view of life. Such a view of meaning impoverishes life and art. The pomegranate tree is highly regarded in the Bible as a thing of beauty. It is an attractive tree, 10 to 15 feet high, with beautiful flowers and appealing fruit. Until recently, and perhaps still, it grew wild in some areas of Palestine and adjacent places. The spies sent into Canaan by Joshua brought back pomegranates to show the wealth of the land. Numbers chapter 13, verse 23. When Israel, in the wilderness of Zin, whined for the good life in Egypt, they remembered its pomegranates. Numbers chapter 20, verse 5. In the Song of Songs, Solomon described his bride's beauty by reference to the pomegranate. Song of Songs, chapter 4, verses 3 and 13, and what is day prized for its loveliness. This again is of interest. At one time, Western man saw aspects of feminine beauty in terms of the loveliness of some fruits, such as cherries, plums, apples, and their blossoms. Now, the stress is on sexuality. There is another aspect to the pomegranate that appears in Joel chapter 1, verses 10 to 12. The field is wasted, the land mourneth, for the corn is wasted, the new vine is dried up, the oil languisheth. Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen, howl, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree languisheth, for the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the fields are withered, because joy is withered away from the sons of men. This is a declaration about God's judgment. The three staples of the day, essential for life and for sacrifices, have been destroyed. Corn or grain, wine and oil. The barley harvest, the food of the poor, is wiped out together with the wheat. The oil refers to olive trees and olive oil. The grapevine and fig tree also represented basic food items, fresh and dried. The palm tree and its dates, and the apple, or possibly the apricot tree, are also withered. The pomegranates provided both fresh fruit and drink. While popular, it was not an essential to everyday life, although it had a double use, for eating as an enjoyable and beautiful addition to the diet, and because it was a powerful anthelmintic, principally against the tapeworm. Within our modern utilitarian outlook, we see harvests as times of work, culminating in payday for the crops. The older view, as reflected by Scripture, tells us that harvests were times of religious and popular festivals, times of celebration and joy. We have a reference to this, one of many, in Psalm 4 verse 7. Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. Thus, what Joel tells us is that not only has God's judgment taken from them the foods essential to their daily life, but also such things as pomegranates, a feast for the eyes, and a witness to the happy richness of life. To limit meaning to the utilitarian aspects of life can be called a modern heresy. To limit beauty similarly is to impoverish life. The biblical priority is for glory and for beauty. 
the emphasis on glory has had a perverted revival in our time. Many young males, with their macho emphasis on a perverse manhood, are prone to strutting in a variety of exotic garbs, hairstyles and the like. The emphasis is on self-glorification and is the antithesis to godly glory. Homer Healy commented on Joel chapter 1 verse 12, With grain and all manner of fruit cut off, the joy of fullness vanishes, hopelessness overwhelms all strata of society. The term, the joy of fullness, is very apt. We cannot understand its biblical meaning unless we grasp the meaning of for glory and for beauty. Unless God himself tells us that something has a meaning beyond the text, we must content ourselves with the fact that this is the purpose God has. Pomegranates represent this. With a biblical delight in pomegranates, in 1917 my father planted a whole row of them on the east side of our garden, seven or eight trees. Although he rarely ate a pomegranate, whereas I did readily, he delighted in them as a part of God's beautiful and glorious creation. This is a spirit very much needed in our time, in every area of life.